Welcome, Welcome to, to Shenanigans Ensue with Mary San Giovanni! Folks, and welcome to Cosmic Shenanigans. I'm your host, Mary San Giovanni, and we are up to shenanigans of cosmic proportions. If I sound terrible, it is because I've caught a cold from the outer darkness, and it is kind of kicking my butt. Uh, it is enough to drive a person to uh, giggling fits of insanity, which is uh, one of the things we're going to be talking about today. We are finishing up our run on Fall of Cthulhu, a series of comics dedicated to the elder gods and old ones of Lovecraftian mythology with really kind of awesome modern new twists. This is the very last set of issues, the last section. It is part six, and it is called Nemesis, for reasons which we will discuss. The story is by Michael Allen Nelson. Art is by Todd Herman. Colors by Digicore Studios, and the letterer is Marshall Dillon. Now, this series of issues, it's shorter than the other issues. Uh, it is essentially a prequel and a sequel, though mostly a prequel. And focuses on the one character still standing from Nyarlathotep's uh, group of minions, and that's his cat. You may recall that he had a cat, Nemesis, which he treated probably better than anybody else. And we had talked a little bit in past episodes about how Nyarlathotep seems to show affection towards certain pets, human or otherwise. But as with all his affections, there are limits and there's a price. And the cat is no different. That he is as affectionate to this cat as he is... I would say more a testament to how long they've been together than to any real sense of love on the part of either one of them. Um, but it starts out giving us Nemesis's view of the events, which is basically that he's won. That when everybody else has been conquered and nobody is left, you're the one that, and you're the one still standing, then you're the winner. You are the conqueror. And you get to basically claim the, the spoils of war. And that's, that's how he views this, because of all of them, he's the only one still standing. What the prequel starts is in 9600 BC in Atlantis. And we see an ongoing battle between the Atlanteans and the Athenians. Now, it is clearly from the Atlanteans' point of view where we have a king, King Levin, and his younger brother, Hadron, who is a high priest and the spiritual leader of the people of Atlantis, uh, leading them in the ways of Vesh, a, uh, a god that I would say is probably akin to somebody like Zeus or something. Um, it's interesting that he's named Hadron. I don't know if that's deliberately a reference to the Hadron Collider, which is uh, in so many um uh it's Im implied in so so much modern cosmic horror that uh if we were close to anything in real life uh, opening doorways to other dimensions that we probably don't want open it would be the hadron collider that does it um that aside though we have him as a high priest and he is essentially tasked by his brother with finding and converting this cult this new cult in Atlantis, a cult devoted to a, a new god, as far as they're concerned, Nyarlathotep. Now, we know from past experience that Nyarlathotep is not one to be trifled with, but in Atlantis, way back then, his cult was small, and his influence in this world was, uh, we could probably safely say, uh, only just beginning to be known by human beings. Now, the king happens to have an oracle, as it seems many ancient people did in myth and legend. And the oracle 
gives advice which is usually pretty dark and depressing, and there's usually a grain of truth to it somewhere, but it may not come out exactly as she says, or it may come out exactly as she says, but not the way you're interpreting it. Now, it turns out that this oracle, who is a pretty large woman, uh, uh, blue skin, red hair, not drawn to be particularly attractive, but rather uh, off-putting, um, and she is, it turns out, Sisyphix. Sisyphix uh, has known both Hadron and Nyarlathotep since the early days. Okay. And uh, Sisyphix gives advice both to the king and to his brother, Hadron. The advice, I guess, if you could call it, that he, she gave to the king was that... Uh, he was going to die and that doom was going to uh, come upon him. And this seems to have only fueled a, a growing madness, which we're going to come back to with King Levin. What he, what Hadron is told by Sisyphus, uh, when she, he basically goes to see her because, you know, being tasked with rooting out this cult of Nyarlathotep, he doesn't know where to find them. So he asks Sisyphus, and she tells him. Um, she also tells him, though, that the last Atlantean will sever the tendrils of Nyarlathotep, and in doing so, become as a god himself. He will be the and and she is she tells him that he Hadron will be the last, and he will watch all of Atlantis die. Now. One of the things that we come to find pretty uh, early on, and and it's laid on pretty heavily, which makes it very hard to pick a character to root for or to actually like, except maybe Nyarlathotep, is that both the king and the priest are hard, cruel men. They're insecure in their positions, and both of them are looking for absolute power. Neither one of them is content with the supreme power that they have in their roles now, uh, but they want to usurp the other's power and have absolute power and control over everyone. And this is not in order to be a benevolent leader. This is not in order to do what is best for the people of Atlantis. This is so that they can have their every whim attended to and their every command obeyed. Uh, they abuse everyone around them. Everyone, including their closest advisors, uh, their minions. Uh, Hadron tortures people into uh, converting to Vesh, to the, to the religion of worshipping Vesh. And they basically demand respect through fear, not through valor or accomplishment or personality. They want people to be afraid of them, and they feel that this is the only way to get people to listen to them. The other issue, of course, with King Levin is that he's probably going insane. They state as much. Um, what comes across, I guess, to them as insanity would come across to us almost in like a, a, a Greek tragedy sort of, in a lot of Greek tragedies and a lot of uh, Shakespearean tragedies as well, a lot of classic tragedies. The issue is that the person can't get out of his own way that there are certain beliefs that he holds that he refuses to accept might be wrong or can be changed. And it's ultimately that which leads to his downfall. Uh, this is the case with King Levin. And that may be a kind of insanity. You know, I guess you could maybe say, you know, if you're sort of stretching the definition, uh, that he refuses to believe in anything but the utter supremacy and power and efficiency of Atlanteans. So when the battle uh, with the Athenians goes poorly, um, he, he blames his advisors for bringing him bad news, not for the fact that the bad news exists itself. In his mind, the Atlanteans are born to water the way birds are born to the sky, he says. And so they should be the supreme... Uh, ship masters and, and naval fleet that, you know, he believes that they are. And even the sea shouldn't be able to take them. Even, even storms at sea shouldn't be able to destroy them. And 
it turns out that more than even uh, Athenians destroying his fleet, it's it's the ocean. It's it's poor decisions on King Levin's part, and that's driven by this growing paranoia that Sisyphus has instilled in him that uh, basically, you know, everyone's out to get him and usurp his power. So he, he ends up trusting people less and less and justifying it with crazier and crazier ideas in his head about what people's motivations are. Uh, so we have a bit of madness, which is definitely a, a it's definitely a cosmic horror thing um, and often a Lovecraftian thing. What we also get, of course, is chaos, which is most definitely a thing, a Nair Lahotep thing. Uh, what we end up seeing is that, you know, as we know, Nair Lahotep is a master of masks. I believe one of his uh, titles it, given to him by Lovecraft, I believe, was um, the the god of a thousand faces or the god of 10,000 faces, something like that. Oh, god of a lot of faces, a lot of faces. And he does. He does have a lot of faces. And what I find interesting is that um, and really we get to uh, what I find probably most interesting about the characterization of Hadron and Nyarlathotep comes at the end. Hadron has rooted out the high priest of Nyarlathotep's cult and tortures him for, I guess it's days. They're not really very clear about that. A Something that looks like a giant pliers is applied to their, like their bottom jaw, you know, to hold their mouth open, kind of. And they're kind of left hanging there, but it's like heated up. So it's like burning metal sort of scratching and, 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 you know, burning into their skin. It's really pretty gruesome. And, uh, it, they're sort of left to dangle that way until they change their minds and, and gen- genuinely, supposedly, to, you know, convert to Vesh's great power and glory. And that's what happens here. Uh, he, Hadron, tortures this man until he basically gives in and, and, and completely changes his tune. And he's very convincing. Uh, this man, this high priest is, is very convincing in, in becoming a, a devout follower of Hadron. And so we see a lot here that the, the people are dedicated to Hadron, not to Vesh. And Hadron knows this. Uh, any decent, high priest would say, no, it's not me you should be worshiping and obeying. It's the God that I am devoted to and through him, you know, an instrument of his will. Uh, but he's actually more pleased that they are slavishly uh, devoted to him. And we come to find that this priest of Nyarlathotep is orchestrating a lot behind the scenes um, a lot of discord between uh, Hadron and his brother. There is uh, a visit to Sisyphus in which we find out, or it is suggested, the true identity of this priest, uh, this high priest of Nyarlathotep. And then Sisyphus, of course, plays her part. And uh, we see that there is a budding friendship here. Um, it is not an even friendship because few things are in these kinds of cases. But Sisyphus does go to the king and tell him that his brother is going to betray him. So we have this power struggle between brothers for the devotion of the people. And again, it's not because of their best interests. It's not in order to protect them and see them flourish. It's purely for power, purely for selfish power. And that ends as, about as well as it ever does, uh, with brother fighting brother and, uh, ultimately the demise of the mad king, uh, at where Hadron feels, okay, now he's, now he's taking over, except for the fact that this high priest that is so devoted to him is really not. And he said that it basically this high priest tells him he's done a wonderful job of sowing chaos. And the spiritual leader of the of the Atlanteans, Hadron, says, wait, you're Nyarlathotep. And, and he changes, Nyarlathotep changes into his true form. 
uh, or one of his true forms. And Hadron says, but so my nemesis all this time has been directly engaging me and I didn't even know it. And Nile Hotep thinks this is kind of funny. He says, your nemesis, because nemesis to him is a, a term which would indicate even distribution of power, even distribution of worth. And Nyarlathotep says, I'm not your nemesis. I'm your conqueror. And it's, it's interesting because you see, you see a certain, again, in this series, uh, a certain mode of thinking that the elder gods possess, which again is very difficult to delve into for reasons that it would be very difficult to delve into the mind of any kind of deity, uh, good or bad. But I think because Nyarlathotep deals so much with the people as a messenger to the outer gods, he deals so much with humanity that we can buy that he's picked up certain quirks. You know, as we've said in the last few episodes that, um, in order to relate to them, he's had to kind of adopt and adapt, uh, certain qualities about humanity in order to relate. And to relate to them only for the purpose of ultimately destroying them, of getting into their minds and sowing chaos. And when Hadron says, why would you, if you could just do this the whole time, then why would you waste time with all this subterfuge? And Nyarlathotep tells him perhaps probably the truest thing uh, that he said to anybody. He said, because it amuses me to do so. Uh, and, and that's probably the most motivation that we get from Nyarlathotep is that it, that if these elder gods were to have contact with us, uh, that we would be a little more than playthings. And Lovecraft has always suggested that. Lovecraft has always suggested that uh, our origin was uh, as playthings, as experiments. Like, oh, what would happen? Like when little kids make uh, things out of Play-Doh and then squash them, you know, squash the Play-Doh when they're done with it. Uh, that's kind of what we're, we're like the Play-Doh for elder gods, uh, that, that they see us as something to play with and then discard when they're bored. And that's kind of what Nyarlathotep says. He basically said that, you know, he'd, he'd talk to the deep ones, which are the minions of Cthulhu and said that, uh, you know, when I tell you, you can have Atlantis, you can have all the people, and you can devour them and offer them up as sacrifices to Cthulhu. He never names Cthulhu specifically, but we can see that at one point, Nyarlathotep and Cthulhu were not at odds with each other completely. And again, as with any kind of alliance with these elder gods, and I, and I do think that although this is, you know, in this way, specific to this series... It does seem to be uh, in keeping with Lovecraft's idea of these creatures that uh, if they're left alone, then humanity's probably okay. If they're not left alone, then it's kind of like poking the sleeping bear, you know. Um, but as far as their interaction with each other, they get on until they don't, you know. They get along with each other until they're tired of each other. And uh, I think that's kind of an interesting concept because really what it does and what this whole series kind of does and what I think modern cosmic horror that tries to delve into the reasoning, the motivation, the thought processes of these ancient godlike entities, what it does, I think, is that it offers this perspective about, uh, divine intervention, which is kind of terrifying. A lot of times when good things or bad things or anything happens in the world, uh, the Christian response is, well, God works in mysterious ways. We're not meant to know. And that to, to venture to try to understand why is only going to meet with frustration because we can only see so much of the picture. You know, we can, we can only see out the window instead of stepping outside and seeing the whole vista. And I think that when modern cosmic horror tries to delve into, uh, 
well, here, look, stand in the doorway and look out at least and see what, you know, see what's going on here. What we come to find is not this divine providence that is guiding creatures we would think of as gods, but motivation that um, maybe at its very most rudimentary and basic, maybe we can understand. And we don't want to believe that creatures that are, you know, as powerful as gods would fall prey to. Things like arrogance, jealousy, fear, uh, hatred, uh, or simple sadism, you know, um, this idea that they can, uh, do what they want, but that ultimately it serves them somehow selfishness, you know? And, uh, I think that's what, uh, I, I think that ultimately that's part of the horror of these kinds of stories that try to look at, you know, why the gods do what they do, because what it says is that there is no divine providence. There is no working in mysterious ways that ultimately, you know, we'll come to understand someday and accept because it was the best possible plan all along, even if it didn't seem that way to us. For us, what we're seeing is the horror of creatures who can be tricked, who can, who, who are very forward thinking, very clever, can see almost all, if not all of the moving parts of the universe and still somehow manage to screw it up, um, either by design or because they are not infallible. It, and to give power, to give absolute godlike power to creatures that are not infallible is kind of a terrifying idea. So there we have it. We have the fall of Cthulhu. And ultimately, the irony of the cats being named Nemesis is that from that point on, when Hadron says to him, says to Nihilahotep, but the oracle said that I would be like a god when I watched Atlantis destroyed, that ultimately it would, it, it would make me like a god. Nihilahotep, who is supposedly from out of Egypt, uh, at least that is where we believe his first interaction with human beings was, turns Hadron into a cat and says, okay, Nemesis, you are like a god, if only to the pharaohs in Egypt. But what he does do is he does seem to give uh, Hadron uh, uh, somewhat a mortal life because he he takes on Hadron as a as a pet and as a favored pet, which leads us to believe that there is something about having maybe worked closely with Hadron or something he admires about Hadron or or just is amused by or likes that he treats. Hadron, now called Nemesis, as a nickname, I suppose, he, he treats Nemesis better than even his human pets. That there's something that uh, maybe it's maybe it's a memory of the old days, which is also an interesting idea to think that uh, these gods who come from the outer reaches of deep dark space are still entities who are alone. Um, they are the only ones of their kind, and. It is interesting to think that they would hold enough nostalgic affection for their own past that they may be more inclined to treat mementos of that past better than uh, they would normally treat a creature of that type. That Hadron is maybe a, a or Nemesis is is maybe a tie to. Um, a familiar time in which a victory for Nihilahotep was uh, happy and uh, amusing. And uh, he reminds him of better days, maybe. So there we have it, the story of Nemesis, who now has reframed and redefined victory. Uh, the last thing we see is him showing up at the doorway of this little old lady who clearly loves cats. And she offers to feed him and give him milk. And as anybody who has cats knows, uh, you don't own a cat. A cat owns you. And there is a sense of godlike power there. And I, I think that to Nemesis, he has come to realize um, that maybe the, the conquering factor here is that he has found somebody to do what he wants, to, to feed him and pet him and, and attend to all his needs. 
but it's somebody that he's not at odds with. It's not somebody that he needs to fear. And whether or not that denotes a change in his personality is, is not really clear. I don't think it does, but it's interesting that to him, uh, he has embraced this sort of mockery of being a god and, and become okay with it and, and, and sees it as a victory. Sees it as a victory over Nyarlathotep because regardless of, of whatever's going on, at least he's still alive and still being attended to. So there you have it, the, the complete run of The Fall of Cthulhu. Uh, it is a great series. I, I recommend picking it up and checking it out. It's got some, some really fascinating cosmic horror goodness in it. Uh, ne- this is the last episode for 2019. 2020, we're going to be starting with all new content, short stories, art, music, even some of cosmic horror seeping into the real world again, since they, they those seem to be pretty popular episodes. And I look forward to getting up to more cosmic shenanigans with you next next year. If you enjoy this episode and want to listen to past episodes and get caught up over the holiday break, then you can check us out at Project Entertainment Network, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, uh, Apple, uh, Apple Music, I think it's called. I'm not sure. They, they keep changing it. Uh, but Apple Podcast. Apple Podcast. Thank you, Brian. Uh, informed me it was Apple Podcast. Uh, so you can check it out pretty much any place where podcasts are available. You can also check out a podcast that I co-host with the aforementioned Brian Keene, which is The Horror Show with Brian Keene, also available through those same sources. Uh, you can check out engineer Matt Wilderson's podcast, Grindcast. Uh, or you can pick up books from either one of us, which are uh, full of cosmic horror goodness. And that would be a great uh, holiday present for both of us. So uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening all throughout this year. And I look forward to chatting with you and getting up to shenanigans again in 2020. Bye. In a world where podcasts lurk around every corner. Listen, we just have to give the people what they want. Get it together. Authors Tim Meyer and Chad Scanlon invite you to an hour of sophisticated conversation. I just want to rip your d- head off for even saying that. Dude, I am just saying what you're thinking. From movies and TV to special guests, you name it, they've got it. I'd rather gouge my eyes out than watch that movie ever again. That's one of the finest movies of our generation. How are you both married? Join them every Wednesday exclusively from the Project Entertainment Network.